<laughs> All right. Welcome, everybody, to the Minecraft Developer Panel, where we will be answering questions from the community. So we'll start off with some basic introductions. Uh, I'm Adrian. I work as the producer for the Java Edition, but today I'll be the moderator for this panel. I'm Anita, producer on Bedrock Edition. I'm Nathan, or Dinnerbone. I'm a developer on the Java Edition. I'm Jason, or Argo Major. I'm a developer on the Bedrock Edition. And I'm Corey, or Kojo, and I'm a developer on the Java Edition. All right, and with that, we'll just get going with the questions. So the first question we got here is, does Mojang think of keeping Minecraft Java Edition up to date with, with the Bedrock Edition as long as Minecraft exists? What do you say, Anita? Yeah, of course. In fact, um, right now, we are co-developing our features now. We want to make sure that all of our players across all platforms get the same features and updates at the same time. They might not come out on the same day exactly, but in the same range of like one to two months. All right, so roughly similar to what we got going with Update Aquatic? Mm -hmm. Yep, that's right. All right, sounds great. So Nathan, do you agree with this? Yeah, I completely agree. I think this, uh, the code development strategy we, we tried out for Update Aquatic, that was the first update that was like half design in Stockholm, half design in Redmond. And I think that went really well. And in addition to that, we're also investing a lot into the, into the Java edition. Like in this update, we got some, some rewrites to like the rendering engine and lots of other optimizations to just try and make sure that this is a platform still worth playing. OK, that sounds great. So similar to the update aquatic, village and pillage update will also be like simultaneously released roughly. Perfect. So let's move on to the next question. Uh, this one is from our China community. Uh, will natural disasters happen in Minecraft, such as typhoons, blizzards, or earthquakes? Uh, Corey, what do you think about this? So while all of these things are very cool, uh, one of the key features of Minecraft that we, we like to follow is that the, the player uh, has to cause the events in the game to happen. Like if you have a typhoon or an earthquake or a hurricane that just happens without the player causing it, that sort of disrupts the game and causes destruction that the, the player is not responsible for, and that's... That's not really what we want, even though those things could be really cool. Yeah, back uh, probably about three years ago, um, I actually did implement a tornado, and it was super cool, and I was super excited about it, and, we, and it was all this fun stuff going on with it. And then um, we started sort of thinking about it, and we're like, you know, that would really suck to be in my world. I've been building my house, working on it for five years, and then a random tornado comes down and destroys the whole thing. Yeah. And we're just like, it just it didn't feel right. And we ended up abandoning that work. Okay, did it ever happen to you that a typhoon or a tornado, sorry, destroyed your house? Not personally. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> you just went on and went on with your happy yeah, basically. So. <laughs> All right, uh, okay, next question then is actually about bugs. So what goes into fixing a bug on the Bedrock Edition? So Anita, can you give us some info on that? Yeah, I can start with, um, well, bugs come from lots of different places. We find them internally. Um, players will report them. So for the player ones specifically, players can put them into our bug database. And then every two weeks, we actually review them all and review the features that, that people want too. And look at them, see what kind of impact they have, what, how they stack up against some of the other things that we want to do, and then um, figure out how we want to tackle them. So after that, that kind of goes into the development side of how we actually go fix them. Jason, you want to expand on that? Yeah, so kind of once we decide which bugs to prioritize, we then assign them out to, because we have multiple teams in the Redmond Studio, and we decide which is the most appropriate team to do that. Those teams then figure out which developer knows that area of the code base best to decrease the chance of introducing new bugs, because um, we want to avoid that as much as possible. And uh, once those come in, then... Uh, we try to repro it. Sometimes we have troubles. We'll, sometimes we'll get the test team to try to repro the bug for us. Sometimes we actually will reach back out to the community and say, hey, is anyone, anyone hitting this bug? If you do, can you please send us your level? <laughs> and um, for the really hard to reproduce ones. And uh, once, they get, once we get fixes, then they go back into the main line and uh, we'll eventually ship in the next update. OK, so when you get a bug from the community, would you say the most important thing is basically having a repro step? So you oh, can, definitely. Yeah. OK, so let's get the repro steps in there, and then we'll be able to fix more bugs. <laughs> we'll fix way more bugs if we get repro steps. Yeah. Uh, Corey, would you like to talk about, about how we fix bugs in the Java edition? Sure. So we have this really awesome uh, community that helps us collect bugs, and that's you all. And then we have the smaller uh, group of volunteers that help us take all the bugs that the community uh, posts on our bug tracker, sort of similar to Bedrock has. 
and they help prioritize them, uh, help us decide maybe they're working as intended already, and then they sort of compile these bugs into a, a list, and they send those over to Adrian and the developers on our team, and then Adrian helps prioritize them, and then helps the developers on the team decide which bugs we're going to fix first. Okay, that sounds great. Um, yeah, with that, we can move on to the next question, I believe. So the next question is, will there ever be brown mushrooms? Or mushrooms is what I'm saying. <laughs> Corey, Corey. No. you look excited. No. <laughs> Don't you dare. Uh, yes, we're going to add brown mushrooms. Uh, oh, no. Really? Yeah, yeah, we're going to add brown mushrooms. Uh, okay, well, Just because of that question. Okay, we will, we will talk about that. <laughs> okay, with that, we can just move on to the next. Uh, what's the hardest feature to get to work across so many platforms? Uh, Anita, you want to talk about that oh, one? Oh yeah. So for Bedrock, there are for we have so many platforms, and um, I would say the hardest features are most generally the input ones, ones because there's you know there's touch that we have to consider, there's VR, there's mouse and keyboard, and um, just getting that experience right for our players and all the different ways you can interact with Minecraft. Um, you know, one of the ones that uh, Jens and Edwin has talked about earlier today was the scaffolding. That's probably very interesting and in how um, we kind of move through that and how we can figure that out. So we did a lot of internal uh, prototypes and things like that. So excited to have that come out for, for us too. Um, outside of input, there's also performance because we have such a wide range of devices um, from a lot of like low-end devices to ones that are super powerful. and um, we just want to make sure that that experience is good for every player um, that, that plays Minecraft. So, Jason, I know you have yeah, a specific yeah, example about that. Yeah, so performance is always an interesting challenge with the wide range. Like, we'll run anywhere from a six-year-old iPhone up to the latest and greatest PC. And uh, so one of the interesting examples, like we always see develop on PCs, and we were running stuff, so we had bubble columns get put into the game. And everything was great. We're like, this is awesome. Bubble columns are cool. And then we tried running them on phones. <laughs> and they weren't running quite so well. So we had to come up with a new solution, which was basically like a, it, on the block. We put an animated texture on the sides. And we actually put a toggle in our game to kind of control. So I believe we did. You have a toggle? OK. <laughs> but, uh, but you can kind of choose which approach you want. And, uh, and you can see it in the, in the cheaper way for the machine or the more expensive way with the bubbles. So the performance heavy thing there, there was the particles really, which you replaced with a texture. Yes. Okay. I mean, yeah, I, I can imagine that there's like, what, there's over 10 platforms that runs Bedrock right now and getting performance up to date, I guess it must be hard. Mm -hmm. um, so yeah, let's go on with the next question. Is there anything you've always wanted to add to the game that you've never been able to? Um, <laughs> Nathan, you want to start with that one? Oh, uh, sure. Um... I remember way, way, way back in the day, my very first entry into Minecraft, I made a mod uh, for Minecraft, and this is like 2011. This is unknown territories back then. And my mod was just very simple. It was, you could build a portal from one place and it takes you to another place. Like, you get to select where it was. And because I'm a huge nerd, I called it the Stargate. And it was great. <laughs> and uh, I remember when I joined Minecraft, or the, the actual team to develop the game, like, I promised all my friends, I vowed, like, one day I'll bring Stargates into Minecraft, but, uh, yeah, one day. <laughs> one day. <laughs> uh, Jason, do you have any examples? Uh, yeah, I, I love adding mobs. Um, so I've, I've, I actually built this giant spreadsheet with, I don't know, like 80 mobs that I proposed that I wanted to add to the game, and I came up and I figured, I'm like, this one would spawn in this biome, and this one would fall in this, and these are things that could, they could drop in the game and stuff like that. And, We'll probably never add all of them. I'm, I'm hopeful with the uh, taiga being chosen that some of them will start to make their way in. And uh, I can't wait to see all that stuff come. But I know we'll never get all of them in there. OK, yeah, thanks. Uh, Anita, I know you're not a developer on the team, but you might have some experience of things you want to add. Oh, yeah, for sure. Uh, I mean, I'm still a hardcore Minecraft player, so there's lots of things I would love to add. Um, so I play at home with my family a lot, and we do a lot of collaborative uh, creative building. So um, we got four players uh, building worlds together, and I would love to have like a collaborative um, like color palettes and block palettes that we can share with each other. Anything like that that makes it easier to collaborate with other people building. Yeah, that would be super cool. 
Um, so Corey then, what was your experience? I mean, you're fairly new on the Java team, but you probably have tons of things you want to do. Yeah, well, uh, I'm a little bit disappointed, I'd be lying if I said I wasn't, that you all didn't vote for palm trees to be added to the game. <laughs> but it's okay, because they will be added eventually. But I, I'm, I'm glad that they're part of the vote, because now I get to add what I've always wanted to add to the game. So, yeah. Yeah, eventually we'll see eventually. that as well. <laughs> okay, we can move on to the next question. Uh, this is what's happening with the super duper graphics pack. Maybe you can answer that one, Jason? Sure. Um, so obviously we showed that off at last Minecon. Um, and ultimately, as we were working on it, it uh, proved to be a lot more challenging to get everything working together. So we're, we've been heavily working on the graphics engine side of things to, to keep working on this stuff. And eventually, we'll be able to put some updates out and let, give people a, a status update on it. All right. Thanks for the update. Um, so next question. Is there any hope for the furnace minecart? I know, Nathan, you've been talking a lot about <laughs> minecarts in general. Yeah, it's, it's, uh, it's kind of a problem because they're just useless in so many different ways. Um, we we, we kind of aren't very happy with the minecart system in general. We actually tried to update them like a few years ago and just like make minecarts more relevant, make minecarts faster, maybe look at the different aspects of minecarts. And I don't know. It, there was like engine limitations. We couldn't do it back then. One day we really want to just revisit the entire minecart system and maybe find a, a good place for furnace minecarts to fit in that. I don't know when that will be, and I don't know how that will look. If right. anyone has any great ideas, you can post them to the feedback <laughs> site. Uh, just tweet in about them. Yeah. Um, oh. <laughs> yeah, back when we were adding the other minecarts, like the TNT minecart and stuff like that on Bedrock, we actually um, we looked at the furnace minecart, and we were just like, we just can't justify spending any time on this, because we looked at it, and they're just inferior in pretty well every way to the powered, uh, ra the powered rail mm -hmm. system, and you can do so much more with it, and it's, you had issues with directional stuff on the furnace minecarts and things like that, and we were just like, we'll, we'll figure out a better version of this one day. I think if they could like, turn on and off, that might be a bit more interesting. But right now they have this crazy bug where they just don't know which way's forward, and so they'll just like, come, suddenly just decide, oh, I'm just going to go the other way. <laughs> All right, so well, then eventually we'll start seeing updates for minecarts in general and not just the furnace minecart. Yeah. Sounds good. So. Um, so let's go on with the next question. Uh, this one is very, it's, it's bedrock centric. Uh, so this is about, will shields be added to bedrock? Anita, you want to speak to that? Yeah, shields. So, so for shields specifically, we do want to add them. So it's just a matter of figuring out when we can add them, but it's definitely something that we want to add. Okay. So. Yeah, I think it kind of ties to the comment Anita made earlier about input, because actually, like on on a PC, you can do the like left left button, right button, things like that. But on touch, like it gets a little trickier. Like, well, how do we how do we actually map to that? Or on a controller, like we've used all the buttons on a controller, um, so we've got to come up with clean ways to do that that feels intuitive, that doesn't make the non something in your other hand that you can interact with feel worse than we used to have. Okay. So we'll get shields on better. We just need the iron on some quirks, I assume. I'm sure we'll figure it out. Yeah, good. Um, so if we go on with the next question, then, is will there be an in-game lore or story at some point in Minecraft? Corey, what do you say? Yeah, so that's a very interesting question, because one of the things that makes Minecraft so awesome is that it's sort of your game to tell the story that you want to tell. I mean, you saw the videos at the beginning of the event. I'm sure you've all watched YouTube videos and played your own games maybe for years and years and years. And the game sort of tells the story that you want it to tell. People create stories using like mods, using resource packs, so many different ways to create different stories in the game. And we like that the player is the one that can tell their own story. And uh, maybe you have more to add there. Yeah. Um, whenever we develop features for the game, we do kind of have a story in our heads. We're like, why, why would this possibly be placed here? And so we, we do try to come up with like our own stories. I'm pretty sure every developer has their own like ideas on it, but we try to be kind of consistent. But the reason why we don't tell anyone any of these is because they change constantly. We, we'll add something new and we're like, oh, this actually would make a lot of sense if, if this and this also happened. Mm. Um, so we, we usually do have some kind of like law in our head, but it's definitely not something we're going to like just make. That is not the story of the game. It really is just the story that you want to play. Yeah, and I've been plotting the secret story of the brown mushroom for seven years now. <laughs> <laughs> okay, perfect. Thanks for sharing. 
so if we go on with the next question, it's why we don't release updates every week or every two weeks. Uh, Anita, you want to talk about the Bedrock side of things? Sure. So for Bedrock, um, because we have so many platforms to support, each of them have different different rules for their certification, how long certain ones take. Some of them are faster than others. And um, we want to make sure that we release those all the same day, at least on Bedrock. We don't have a magic button that just says go, and then it goes out to all of our players. So um, that takes some time to do. And the every week or two weeks is um, a little bit too fast for us, but we're getting there in terms of how we can optimize, how fast we can get out updates. Jason, do you have anything to add to that? Yeah, one of the other challenges is just there's a lot of overhead in getting a release out. There's the builds running through, like giving the testers enough time to bash on the build to make sure that we didn't introduce anything that breaks the game and stuff like that. And that takes a lot of time. So we want to make sure that because of things like going through the stores and that, we have, a, we have enough turnaround time. We want to make sure that what we put in there is, is the best quality we can. So if we were doing releases every week or every two weeks or something like that, we would spend all our time doing that, and we wouldn't get to do all the cool stuff that we got to see earlier in the Minecon. I see. It's much the same on Java Edition as well. We, we kind of have, like, if the more frequently you post out the updates, the less can be in an update, because there's just so much overhead from the update. But uh, we actually do release every, usually multiple times a week on Java Edition, but those are for snapshots. And so those are a way to, like, if you accept the risk of a really, really unstable and buggy game, so we may not have yet have got to, to the point where you can fix all the issues with the new things we add, then you can play stuff yeah. quite soon. Yeah. Okay. So, some snapshots also, prove our point about uh, they need more testing time. <laughs> yeah, but they, they also, they've been a fantastic tool for oh, us yeah. because we, we kind of design things as we go whenever the snapshot starts. So we'll add a feature and then we put it out there and people get to play it. And then within like hours, we'll have all this great feedback from people. It's like, it should do this as well, or maybe this is a bit too difficult. Yeah. And, uh, and then we can just like, fix it for the very next day and push out an update. So, so it is really useful to be able to push out updates this fast, but it's just it was very, yeah. very difficult. Yeah. It also ties into the, the bugs, like the question earlier about fixing bugs. It really, really helps us find bugs in the game and uh, fix them when we can do snapshots like once or twice a week, and people can report those bugs so quickly so we know what's going on in the game and we don't let bugs sit for too long. We can fix them before they get too deep. Yeah. There's also the story aspect, too. So like we could trickle out little things here and there, but then sometimes like you just want things to go together. Like hey, we, It was meant to have like X, Y, and Z feature together to I don't know, be more fun for the players, too. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I guess it was, some features wouldn't make sense without the other, really. Mm -hmm. Yeah. All right. It was actually kind of cool. The uh, snapshots, I wasn't really expecting this on Aquatic, but we actually got tons of information for the Bedrock team from the Java snapshots yeah. because it was kind of funny because we were actually looking at all the feedback as well. And some of the features, we had actually implemented them first, and they actually went out in a Java snapshot. So we're actually seeing things about the drowned and stuff like that. And I'm like, oh, yeah, that's a good point about the drowned. I should probably go change that in our version <laughs> and, and stuff like that, which was super awesome to get that feedback. Really yeah, early, that was great. Which we never could have gotten with the Bedrock process. Yeah, I mean, we appreciate any feedback we get, so I mean, keep on, keep on going with that. Okay, uh, let's try and move on to the next question. So the next question is, are there plans to make Minecraft more than just a video game? Uh, Nathan, you want to speak about that one? Uh, I would say it already is. So, okay, it is still just a video game, but I'd like to mention we, we just announced uh, Dungeons earlier, which is amazing. I'm so excited for that. <laughs> and, uh, and you know, we, we've got to have a video game, so we had story mode, and, uh, and then there's a movie coming out, and we've got so many books. I think at this point, Minecraft is just kind of, it's cheesy to say lifestyle, but that is basically what it is. It is just a thing, and so many people experience it in whatever ways they want to experience it. So I, I would say we passed the video game point a long time ago. Yeah, I can agree with that. Yep. Jason, do you have anything to add to that? I 100% agree with that. Okay. <laughs> I couldn't have said it better. <laughs> All right. Uh, let's try the next question then. So when will Bedrock get NBT-related commands? And for people who doesn't know what NBT-related commands is, could, could you explain it? Sure. Um, so NBT is the, the name of like the internal data structure that the, that the game uses. It's basically like the save file format. 
And some time ago on Java Edition, we added commands that can edit the MBT, which is basically like, you can change the world to exactly how you want. So you can make entities start writing and any other entity. You can have dragons writing pigs, which I don't know, crazy size. There's just so many <laughs> crazy things you can do with MBT. But on the other hand, it is extremely difficult to support this. It's, it's been the source of countless bugs in the game. And every time we, we release a new update, we just kind of have to consider, oh, we can't really change the internal stuff that we never expected people to be touching because we'll break so much stuff. Um, yeah, so the ba kind of based off of when we were bringing commands into the game, uh, because of some of the issues that the Java team had experienced and challenges that they'd, they'd hit with that, we kind of chose not to put NBT commands in because ultimately it is, as, as Nathan said, it's exposing internals and it kind of locks you to those internals because if we ever change it, we now have to support the previous version and the new version of it, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And with this game being around for so many years, it becomes a, a huge bottleneck for us to, for testing and all the stuff. It makes our releases actually take longer to go out and makes repro like reproing issues harder because you're like, well, this command isn't working for this one player. And it's like, well, it works for us fine, but it's like, oh, because they're running it on like seven versions ago of, of that stuff. So the, the kind of stance we've been taking on the Bedrock Edition is that we want to enable the same types of things, but not by exposing externals. So some of it's through add-ons. We would love to try to get a little more of the stuff we have in add-ons tied into commands a little more tighter and stuff like that. And we're still talking through a lot of the ways to do that. But definitely the goal is to allow the same types of things just in a more supportable way. Uh, I think that's a very good idea as well. The, these kind of things should have like a, a more formal way of doing exactly the same functionality that, that we can actually go out of our way to support rather than just kind of hoping it works. Yep. Okay, so we'll get a similar solution or that works in the same way that MBT does but without exposing MBT. Correct. All right. Uh, okay, uh, with that, I think we can move on to the next question. Uh, this one is more on the fun side. So why do creepers explode when they come near you? I, I feel like you've answered this before, Nathan. Yeah, I have. Isn't it obvious? So they just really want to hug. And, and people are just like very scared of creepers. They get very anxious. So they, they just kind of come up to you and they're just like, can I have a hug? And then... Uh, well, you know, the, it's just too much for them. It really is. And, and especially because some players try to attack them first. Can you imagine? <laughs> They're so cuddly. I just want a hug. But, yeah. but Nathan, they don't have arms. That's why they want a hug. Ah, yeah, I see. They have never had a hug before. It looks so nice. Uh, I, I can definitely agree with that. <laughs> okay. So uh, let's go with the next question then. So what was the most difficult feature to add to Minecraft? I think we all have our own personal experience. So Corey, maybe you want to start on this one? Yeah, so uh, I haven't been on the team for too long, but uh, in the, the next update, the village and pillage update, uh, in the video you probably saw if you were watching, had some, uh, the pillagers and the beast, and they were roaming as a squad together towards a village. Uh, so the most difficult feature that I've worked on so far is getting them to be a cohesive unit and going together to pillage. Okay, so you're saying like basically the AI off the raids is the most difficult thing. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Balancing the raids, making it so they don't just immediately destroy you and everything that you've loved. But it looks like fun. It does. Yeah. It's, it'll be fun. It'll be challenging. It'll be fun. Sounds great. Uh, what about you, Jason? Um, probably for me, the most challenging has been actually doing the add-on stuff. And it was mostly because to achieve the add-ons, we basically had to take all the gameplay code and completely restructure it and write a lot of things from scratch. But at the same time, we didn't want to change the behaviors. Like everyone, they expect creepers to work a very specific way. They expect skeletons to work a very specific way. So we had to try to, by, even though we were changing everything, we wanted it to feel the same and then expose all that there. And then now we've kind of had a, a I won't quite say a maintenance nightmare, but we're, we're, in, we're getting into that realm of kind of what we talked about with NBT earlier. Is like now we have to make sure we're doing everything we can to not break people who've built add-ons on top of this stuff. So every time we're changing things, we're going, okay, well, what? How could this change something? If someone, was, if someone was relying on a specific behavior, how could that affect them? And we try to write up conversion code to say, okay, well, it, it was working this way, but now it needs to work this way. So we have to kind of always be thinking about that stuff. Okay, it's so like the, the backwards compatibility is yeah. key factor here. All right. Uh, Nathan, what about you? There are so many things over so many years. Yep. It is really hard to, to pinpoint, like, the defining thing. I remember there's been so many bugs that I've spent literally months on and I just gave up at some point. 
But uh, I think I'm going to go with my classic answer. I'm a nerd. I've just been talking about portals. For me, the thing that I've been trying to perfect for so long, and I still haven't, is the portal mechanics. So for example, you can have like a small portal and a really big portal on the other side. And if you go in like slightly to the left, you should come out slightly to the left on the other one. There's just so many weird, like, it's, it's a whole different realm of math than I ex ever expected to go into. <laughs> So this is why you gave up on your Stargate idea. Yeah, basically, yes. <laughs> One day I'll have, I'll have them working the way I want. You One can day. do it, Nathan. I believe in you. It's just it's no? like so many things. Like if you go in, go in one side, which side do you come out of? Because there's no front and back. It's, yeah. it's, yep. it's crazy. <laughs> Portals are a pain. Yeah, I, I can see that. Uh, Anita, what about you then? I know you, you don't develop, but you probably have a lot of things that's yeah. been a struggle. Um, well, we haven't talked too much about this one, but in... Um, having a shared identity across all the platforms that we support. So uh, how do we show that to the players, players that you're playing with on different platforms and making sure that's consistent and that you get to be, um, understand what identity you have and be whoever you want to be. Okay, so, so you're trying to get like the same experience wherever you are really. Mm -hmm. hmm. Okay, um, with that we can move on to Next question, I think it's very similar to the one we just answered. Uh, and where does the creeper's fear of cats come from? Uh, Jason, maybe you have an idea about this? I think we all have our own theories. I personally think that they are allergic to cats, and they're trying to not uh, sneeze. Okay, yeah, I can see that. Nathan, you? It's, it's a very good question. We've actually, we've wondered this ourselves as on the developer team. <laughs> Um, it just kind of happened. Nobody really knew how. Um, we, we, we sent like a, 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 a great team of investigators to try and kind of figure it out. Um, and they decided, where can, we, where can we get the answer to this? So they, they just built this beautiful house and they invited a creeper inside. They just kind of locked the door and then went in and they just went, hey, creeper, why are you so afraid of cats? Um, unfortunately, he was put on the spot. It was too much pressure. He exploded. The results are negative. We're still working on it. Oh, okay, yeah, I can, I can see that happen. <laughs> <laughs> Okay, let's go on with the next question. Um, can we get a more variety of gems, trees, and ores? Is that something that's happening, Corey? Uh, so we all love new gems and new trees and new ores, and everybody wants more. But we have to make sure that when we add new things to the game that they serve a purpose, and we have to make sure that they fit in with the other things in the game. So when we add a new gem or a new tree or a new ore, we want it to interact with the existing game, but also add something new to the game, because we want every single thing that we add to be unique in some way so that it adds a value with that. So yes, we're going to add more, but we don't want to just throw a bunch in at once because that wouldn't be fun. I, I think it is very important that whenever we add something, it, it does have like so many different purposes. And, and I think if we just release one update that just had like, we've got 10 new type of things, but they, they don't really do anything. I think we're all going to be very sad. If that yeah, happens. the trick is always to make sure that there's new gameplay that comes out of these. these Absolutely, updates. there should be a reason for it. Like it should feel like it's really bringing something very useful to the game. Yeah. Yeah. So you just don't add something randomly that doesn't have any purpose, really. Just we add an ore, it should do something. Is what you're saying? I mean, we break that rule all the time, so I'm not going to say that is the golden <laughs> rule, yeah. but we try to stick to that. Yeah. Like. It, and, and especially when, when you consider, like, with ores, you've got, like, the current, you've got all the tiers up from, like, stone is not really an ore, but uh, all the way up to diamond. But you can get diamond really fast in this game. So if we added a whole bunch of other tiers, they're just useless. Like, for weapons and armor, tools, you're just going to go to whatever the best. They, they need to really have their own, like, shining purpose to, to have some reason to use those over whatever the best is. Do you, do you have any idea of any ores you want to add yourself? <laughs> <laughs> uh, not really. I, I think we're... No, I, I can't think of anything there. Okay. I oh. remember I once shot down an ore, though. Like, the, when I first joined the team, we had Ruby mm. was an ore. But I was colorblind, and it was impossible to tell the difference between that and redstone. And so now we got emeralds. Yeah, I, I can oh. see that being a problem, definitely. <laughs> Okay, so I think that clears up on how we, we think about ores and gems in general. Um, so with the next question here, there is, will you ever add more redstone components? Uh, Anita, what do you say about that? Uh, yeah, definitely. 
Yeah. Yeah. Agree? Yep. Yeah. Yep. So. Mm -hmm. You all agree? Any idea of what these redstone components could possibly be? Any recent ideas or? We we have a lot of crazy ideas that just pop up now and again. Um, it's it's hard to find. So there's two parts of this. Is really something that is built for redstone. It's like you know a new circuit or something like that. And then the other half is just like something that can interact with redstone in some kind of way. Um, I'm, I'm not promising this, but I know one thing we talked about, just like a couple of us talked about on the yeah. side, was an idea of a target block where if you just shoot an arrow into it, it'll give off a signal based on how much it was. And it just sounded like so much fun. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's on your backlog now. Oh, no. <laughs> This sounds like a cool idea, but what, what would I use it for in game if I were to use it? Like, can you think of anything like top of your head? I think you can do a lot of things with that. Like you could have just like a, a practice range where it, like you have to be this good to get into a building or you could use it in custom maps. I don't yeah. know. It's, it's definitely not something we're, we're going to add right now. Yeah. It's just like a, a crazy idea that we have. Yeah. And I know we have a lot of similar ideas. Yeah, I was just thinking right now, like if you tied the power signal to like, if it looked like an actual target and you tied it to how close you were to the center, you could actually have things like you need to hit it point, you need to hit it right in the center to open a door or something like that, because that would be the highest power output mm. and, and things like that. So there's, there's definitely some cool stuff that could be done. Yeah, I can see that creating a lot of cool adventure maps, really. Yeah. Um, but Jason, you've been around for a very long time on the gameplay team as well. Do you, have you ever thought of any redstone components? Um, mostly I try to modify existing ones. Like I, yeah. it, I'll admit, Redstone is a bit of a mystery to me when I try to build circuits. I'm not very good at it. Um, so I always want like sticky redstone or, or be able to put like dust underwater or something like that. But those are all just crazy ideas. I, I mean, it seems like reasonable ideas that possibly sometimes <laughs> you never know. That's just my experience here. We do try to think like whenever we add a new block and it seems like it could have any possible connection to redstone, like maybe you could turn it on and off. We do try to think of, of yep. new things to add. But I don't think we've, we've so far just thought of like, specifically this is useful for redstone. Yep. Um, maybe we just haven't gotten to an, the next redstone update, I'm yep. not sure. <laughs> in, in my mind, the redstone update was still quite recently. <laughs> oh, it's not that recently though. I know, it's not. <laughs> I think we've, had, we've had redstone for like two years or something now in Bedrock. Mm. So it does actually feel kind of recent. Yeah. All right, uh, let's move on with the next question. Who made the structures like jungle temples, ocean monuments, and strongholds? Anita, could you speak to that? Um, yeah, so for the ones that you mentioned, um, Lee Viennes had, had put those in, but I don't, I don't think that's what you're actually asking. Um, in terms of lore, I think, Nathan, you might have more to add there. Uh, well, I'll, I'll answer this question with a question. If, if these, whoever built these had like mine shafts running through the entire world, um, they're all over the place, but they've left all of the diamonds, all of the good stuff alone. What were they digging for? Hmm? I thought they were digging to leave the things for me. Oh, yeah, yeah. yeah. Okay, well, that's solved. There we yeah. go. Okay. <laughs> for Adrian. Adrian's <laughs> secret <laughs> of the mile. It's my mind. All <laughs> Corey, do you have any idea about this? I mean, this kind of ties back to the whole telling your story thing. I mean, we have our own ideas about mm -hmm. who built them, but if we put that in the game and we said, this is the reason these are here, well, then you wouldn't be able to come up with that on your own. So we sort of like that there's a little bit of a mystery to it because that adds a little bit of fun. Yeah. yeah. Maybe you guys have some great ideas and then we'll steal those later. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> okay, uh, let's try and move on with the next question. Uh, were there any features in Update Aquatic that you got rid of or that you scrapped? Uh, Jason, I know you um, might have Yeah, so we actually had a mob that ended up in the Minecon mob vote last year, the, the Barnacle but it was originally brainstormed as a enemy mob that we would put in Update Aquatic. So it was, it was the one, if you don't remember, it had the kind of a shell and it would open up and a big tentacle came out, would grab you and pull you underwater until you suffocated, which I loved, but uh, maybe a little too dark. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, so, so we, we, we were brainstorming it and kind of going, well, this, is, this one's is interesting, but we weren't totally sure about it. So we, in this case, we chose to put it in the Minecon vote and just see how the community reacted. But for the other features, we mostly um, brainstormed a whole bunch of stuff, put all these things on the wall, and then we just had everyone in the, in the brainstorm session kind of go, well, these are the things that we think will really resonate well and are most likely to be successful if we work on them. So we kind of worked on those in order, and we actually were fortunate enough that everything we started, we actually finished and did end up shipping. Um, usually doesn't work that way, but for Aquatic, it did. 
So there was supposed to be one scary mob, but uh, it didn't go, and uh, it's all your fault. <laughs> <laughs> we did have the drowned. Uh, I think it's very good, actually, whenever things do get cut. Um, I mean, it, it's unfortunate if we spend like a month, two months trying to make this really cool feature. Tornado. Tornadoes. <laughs> and, and then we have to get rid of it. But I think ultimately it's a good thing for the game. Yeah. We, we don't want to add anything that isn't fun. We don't want to add anything that doesn't feel Minecrafty. Um, and we always try to cut those like at the beginning. Like I know there was a shopping list. There was a gigantic list for, for the update aquatic. It was just like, what if we had this? What if we had this? And then uh, after a few meetings, we just kind of got rid of a lot of things before we even tried prototyping them. But I, I do think that it, like, it's a very good thing as a studio to be able to say, we did put effort into this, and then we found out that it didn't quite work. But maybe we can use the lessons we learned from this to make something even better later. But if you've already started prototyping a feature and you've been going at it maybe for like a couple of weeks and then you end up needing to scrap it because it doesn't really work out, how do you feel about that? I'm okay with it. <laughs> like, Because ultimately it's, we want to have a fun game experience and if something is detracting from that, it's, it doesn't make sense to put it in just to like make somebody happy that their work showed up in the game. Like mm. All of us just want the best game experience we can possibly make. The, the flip side of this though is if you do make a feature and it actually goes out to the public. So let's say we announced it, or it even made it into a snapshot, or even a whole release. It is really hard to take that back. And, and that's why I think it's very important to, to take it, to cut it first. And uh, like, it's very hard to take features away from people once they have oh, yeah. it. And it, it can be quite depressing, really, if you do put a lot of, a lot of yourself, because all these features, we're, we're still fairly small development studio. We put a lot of love, a lot of care into making all of these things. And when they don't make it in, yeah, that can be, that can be very sad. But then you're making the game much better. It's ultimately good, though. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, it's part of experimenting, right? Yep. It's like uh, the, the fail fast idea. It's like, hey, let's try this out. Let's make sure you know, we, we nail the fun part. And if it's, it's not there, let's go and tackle the ones that, you know, the other ideas that we had. Yeah. So. I think fortunately we've gotten to a point where we've gotten reasonably good at actually kind of just as we're at the, the brainstorming phase, kind of, you know, that's probably not going to work, or, or this will work, but it's, it'll have these problems that we'll have to go figure out, and maybe it's not worth trying to solve those problems right now. And then some of them just we put on the back burner, and like maybe in a future update we'll revisit that topic again. Corey, as you knew, do you have any experiences with this yet? <laughs> uh, <laughs> well, there are a lot of features that I would like to add. Being new to the team, I sort of came in on day one and was like, okay, I'm going to add this, 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 and this. <laughs> and I started just working on them at work, working on them in my free time. And then I sort of realized that you can't just get everything into the game because, like I answered earlier, you have to make sure it fits in with everything else. Uh, so, yeah, it's sort of part of the game where you, you can work on something and it can get taken away, but at the same time, sometimes you do work on something and it doesn't get taken away and it just ends up fitting really well, and that's nice too. Mm. Yeah, great answer. Thanks. Um, so the next question we got here is, where physically is the end? Is it in space, is it underground, or is it in another dimension? Uh, Nathan? Part of me really wants to just go into a Beastie Boys Another Dimension uh, <laughs> chant. It's, it is a completely different dimension. Um, I know a lot of people think like the Never is underground, like deep, deep underground. No, that's, that's also Another Dimension. That's where you've got the weird like eight times portal aspect going on there. Um, it's just like another plane of reality that it happens exactly over the, the overworld and the Never. Um, and, and that's why there could also be lots of other possible dimensions one day, because um, they're not physically anywhere, they're just like layered over the top of each other. That sounds cool. So what you're saying here is that we could possibly get other dimensions? Yes. One day? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> no. This sounds great. Um, okay, let's go on with the next question then. So the next question is, will there be new characters other than Steve and Alex? Anita? Yeah, so Steve and Alex, um, well, the way that we think about Steve and Alex are that they are just some of the characters in the Minecraft universe, and the players, they're a template for you guys to imagine yourself in the world. So you are also characters in Minecraft. Um, in fact, I think we were talking earlier today about uh, the, how we want to represent ourselves. I, I can't remember what yours was, Corey. I'm was, the cookie monster. Oh, that's right. <laughs> Um, I, like, I, I like silly ones. Um, there's like the hot dog or like the little gas. Um, but I also like the Norse, some of the Norse stuff as well. Greek mythology for me. You're a Greek mythology guy? Yeah. yeah. 
Sounds cool. Uh, Nathan? Jason and the Argonauts. I'm just me, <laughs> upside down, as yeah. usual. <laughs> <laughs> it's weird being right side up for this. It's very disorienting. <laughs> I, I can imagine. We'll go to Australia next time. Yeah. Yes, that's <laughs> yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Okay. Um, anyone else want to add something to that? Corey, do you like, what do you think about not having other characters than Steve and Alex? Again, I think it goes back to the story thing. And I think it's pretty cool that you can have your own characters and tell your own stories. And it's sort of nice that Steve and Alex are just two portrayals of what you could be in this world. Because I know there are certain YouTubers out there who just like to keep the, the plain skin, and that's awesome. And then there are certain people who like to come up with their own skins, and there are people who's, who make a career out of just making you know, characters for people who can turn that into their own stories. Yeah. So I really like that the Steve and Alex are a starting point, but not really the, the ending point. I, I do agree, again, with the, the whole, it's your story, it's not our story. Like, we, we do present some possible stories of like story mode and the books and stuff, but ultimately, you, you play what you want to play. Yeah. Great answer. Thanks. Uh, so if we move on to the next question then. So why can't the villagers actually have moving arms and why can't they talk instead of saying, hmm, all the time? Thanks, I guess. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, we, we, we cleared this up now, I think. <laughs> uh, so, next question. <laughs> With the overworld and the nether, will heaven or paradise join Minecraft in the future? Uh, Nathan? Maybe. Um, like I said before, we, we have room for other dimensions if we want to, because they're not, like, they're not underground, they're not up in the sky. Um, it just kind of falls back to, we're still not very happy with the current dimensions, you know. The end got a lot of love recently. Um, we're adding lots of things to the overworld right now. Uh, the Never also got some love some time ago, but still not really happy with where they are. So I think before we start adding even more places where there's no real big reason to go to them, we should still focus on the current, the, the free current dimensions and just make sure we're very happy with those before we start adding even more stuff, more places. Do you agree, Corey? I agree completely, and I think uh, what you were mentioning about wanting to give the dimensions we have some more love is, is great, and I think it's sort of nice because with the dimensions that we have, when we, when we update those and when we give them you know, some more love, then we can sort of think about what would be a really nice counterpart to this. Like if you're in the overworld, you're in the nether, you're in the end, like what would be a good addition to these things? And so it sort of does make sense to think about it in terms of what can we add to the game that adds not just a new dimension, but a new uh, style, a new way of thinking in the game. There's also, um, unfortunately, not to talk about gameplay side of this, but from the technical side of this, adding new dimensions is very expensive. Yeah. Um, I'm sure you can talk yeah. more about that. Yeah, definitely. Like, um, like you think there's a lot of work going into like a biome update and stuff like that. A dimension is just a whole other level above that. But um, nice pun. We all, but because of because it's so much work, like actually, like we do uh, game jams pretty regularly in our studio. And I've actually gone off and like prototyped a bunch of these things. And it mostly it's just to kind of get that conversation started. And we want to just sort of like in the back of our heads, we're kind of thinking about it. There's never any goal of like, oh, we're going to go prototype a dimension and we'll ship it in six months. Like we know that's not going to happen because of like we talked about like there's, there's so much stuff that we could do to improve the overworld and the nether. And I'm sure the end still has stuff we could add in there. But we want to at least get thinking about it. Because these are, these are things that could take years to, um, to really flesh out and have it be something that's meaningful. And, and they also, unfortunately, are, well, I don't know about the Bedrock engine, but on the Java edition, they are quite a performance drain. Like, just having an extra dimension means your game runs slower, and we don't want games to run slower. So we're going to make sure that that isn't a problem before we start adding even more things. Yeah. Is that the same case with the Bedrock edition? It's less of a case. It's certainly, it's, for us, it's mostly the number of players and kind of where they are. So when players are in the same place, it mm. tends to be better. As players start to separate out and go in more places, you do that. And then the more dimensions you have, the easier exactly. it is for players to start spreading out. But it's not too different for us if you just have 10 players all in the overworld, but they're miles apart. But if you have them, it, it, it's about the same. There's, there's a bit of cost and overhead to it, but it's not as terrible as it sounds. <laughs> yeah, and when you add a new dimension, I mean, you think about the nether and the end, they sort of add tiers to things that you have in the overworld, and they sort of give items and blocks a, a new level. Uh, so if you were to add a new dimension, you would sort of think about it in terms of, like, yeah. how would this affect the overworld as well? And you have to... Yeah. And it, it, it takes a long time to yeah. take all those into consideration. But it's all back to that whole meaningful thing. Yeah. Like, whatever we add to the game, it needs to be meaningful. So now you're talking about, like, a whole dimension of stuff to add to the game and how you fit that all in. Anita, would you like to see a new dimension? 
Of course I do. <laughs> <laughs> or you're like anti dimensions. No, I hate dimensions. No, I love dimensions. <laughs> yeah. yeah, but it's the same thing. Like, what, what, what are we going to put in there? What does it mean? What is the player going to do? So, um, yeah, I mean, Minecraft's always expanding and evolving. So, um, definitely not shutting the door on that one. Yeah, sounds great. Uh, with that, I think we can move on to the, the next question then. So, the next question is how do, you, how do we think of updates for Minecraft? And it's a follow-up question to that. What is the hardest thing in updating Minecraft? Uh, Anita, you want to start? Yeah, so let's see. When we're thinking about what next for the next update, um, we look at our game, see what kinds of things need improvement, what areas need improvement. Um, might be whole areas like the ocean or you know the villages and things like that. Um, but then we also have... A, a, lots of ideas of just all over Minecraft, too, of like what we want to improve. Um, and we can see what kind of goes together. Um, so that's like two ways to think about that. Um, so do you want to expand on how the teams actually go sure. and meet? Yeah, so like uh, you mentioned about we have all these kind of separate ideas. So another place we get a lot of ideas from, obviously, is just the community. Like the number of features in the game that have come from Reddit comments is kind of hilarious. <laughs> um, but we've, but we, once we kind of decide on a theme, um, we basically just get everyone into a, a room and we start brainstorming all these ideas and, and then the teams kind of agree of like which stuff, I kind of talked about this a little bit with Aquatic, but we kind of agree these are the things that we think are going to resonate really well and, and work on that. And then we kind of split the work between the two teams and uh, start implementing, prototyping everything. And then, uh, and then we actually give feed, both teams look at what the other team's been doing, give a lot of feedback on there and everything like, I think of one cool example of that is the coral. Is it was initially implemented in the Redmond Studio um, when the Stockholm team saw it. They actually had all this like like we had a completely different vision for what coral would look like and is and, and all that stuff. And and we sort of had this initial kind of like oh my god like we got to change everything. This is terrible. And then we actually went through the work and we're like coral's way better now. Like this is <laughs> it, it was a huge improvement to it. And and it's, it's really easy when you're working on stuff to just be kind of like. This, like I've got tunnel vision in, this is what I think is going to be. And then you see people with some fresh perspective look on it and it can make a huge difference. Uh, and as far as actually like thinking of which update, like what is the theme of the update, um, that's usually just what do we think needs the most like, love in the game. Um, so recently we had like the oceans and the oceans were just a giant half of your world is literally nothing. And, and that felt so sad. So that was like, these really needed love. And we, we've, you, we tried to keep these planned like a couple of updates ahead. We may not have fleshed them out, but we know generally we want to look at this thing. They um, had squids. They did have <laughs> They could have had a new mob as well. But they, could have, you know. they, they could have had another one. <laughs> yeah, looking at Update Aquatic, pre-Update pre Aquatic, and then going back, it's, it's hard to like, not to go back, it, it, to me it feels like there's just gravel everywhere and a couple of squares. <laughs> yeah. So is there anything else, Corey? What, what do you think about how we work with the updates? Uh, when I joined, we were right before Update Aquatic was being released and uh, I sort of jumped into this craze of like, oh my gosh, we need to fix all of these bugs and we need to like, make sure all these features work right and we have to get everything done like now. Uh, so I would say the hardest thing, maybe from my experience so far, would be to coordinate the the order of like which bugs do you fix first, which ones are the highest priorities. Um, how do you decide like okay, this is this is good enough, this is ready for release, and uh, matching that up with the goal of when we want to release, and that sort of okay. matching those together. I, I do have to say though, since Update Aquatic was the first first update we actually developed with this style where it's like the 50-50 split, I think it has gone amazing. I could not be happier with it. We've got so much content out of it. Uh, we've got so many great things. I think everything we've added kind of just has much more polish than, than we usually would. We get a lot more perspectives across the yep. teams and all the, the types of um, platforms or you know, our players and things like that too. Um, you, know, you were talking about coordinating, and one of the other things that's difficult is um, the time change. So um, we and the Bedrock side are pretty much working when they're asleep. So um, I know that there's many times where I'll just like write down all the things that, that like, oh, can you help with this? Or like, oh, what about this thing? And I'll go to bed and I'll wake up and like all these new ideas and answers have come through. It's like Christmas morning or something. <laughs> it's like, wow, all this work happened when I was asleep. So that really feels good. But you know, there are 
challenges that we have to work through. I mean, too. I can definitely agree with that. I know recently we had a meeting that was uh, nine in the morning for us in Stockholm, which is midnight over in Redmond, and that was kind of crazy. <laughs> we tried to avoid those meetings, but you know, sometimes they happen. Uh, how do you guys feel about having these late night meetings? Oh. <laughs> I was going to talk about yeah. when um, I, so I opened the call and I was like, oh, it's too bad it's late. I'm not going to show you guys like what I'm doing because I'm always in my pajamas or something. And then we had a technical difficulty and all of a sudden the camera was on. <laughs> and I was like, oh, uh, hi, everybody. So you can see me now. So I think with that, you know, it's nicer to see each mm -hmm. other. And um, I think going forward, I'll just... Um, no matter what I look like, I'll just turn on the camera. <laughs> but, well, uh, you know, we're within, not like safe, safe. <laughs> right. Would you say there's like, any, any <laughs> perks of having these time, this time difference then? The perks? Oh, yeah, I, the, I think so. Yeah. Like, like with, um, you know, us, it almost feels like double speed sometimes, right? With the, the different time zones and, um, yeah. You guys have anything else to comment on this? We're developing around the clock. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. yeah, definitely the perks is what I need to talk about earlier. Of the, it's like, hmm, I got this in, not quite sure if this is working right. Here's a video, and then you come back in in the morning, and Jens or Dinnerbone or Agnes or whoever is kind of weighed in and gone. He's like, what do you think about this? And you're like, oh, that's awesome. <laughs> and, you, and you go off and you code it up, and it's, it's pretty, pretty amazing. Okay, sounds great. Um, I think we can move on with the, to the next question with that. So the next question is, is it possible to move Bedrock worlds over to Java and vice versa? I guess we can start with Bedrock to Java. Nathan? Uh, it's something we want. I mean, we feel like our players should be able to play the same world wherever they want. Um, it's just quite technically challenging. We, we do have two different engines. We've, we've gone about the same thing in two different ways. And we just kind of have to find ways to, to coordinate those and make those better. Um, and because of how difficult that is, it, it just hasn't been a priority for HES. But it's definitely some, something we want to look at at some point. Mm. Yeah. Jason, maybe you're Yeah, one of the historical problems for that was that um, the Bedrock version hadn't really caught up to the Java version either. So if we tr like, it wouldn't be so bad for bringing Bedrock into Java, but Java back into Bedrock would have been challenging because it's like, okay, well, someone built their house out of purper, and you're like, we don't know what purper is because the game didn't have purper in it. Um, so. Now that we're actually pretty well, I think we have pretty well everything. They're, they're, I'm sure there's, there's so many blocks and items and stuff in the game, we're probably missing something, but we're pretty darn close. So now it's actually feasible for us to even like, like start talking about the possibility of doing this. Yeah, it would be great to see you players being able to walk across any platform they want. Yep. Okay, uh, next question is a, a bit of a more vague question, and I guess you can interpret it how you want, but how, what, what do mo hostile mobs dream of, really? Pink sheep. It's pink sheep? Pink sheep. I, think, I checked. I think, it's pink sheep. Yeah, I think creepers have nightmares about cats. <laughs> okay. <laughs> sure. <laughs> Corey? <laughs> I think that about sums it up. I mean, I can't think of anything that they would dream of except for those things. Though I've never seen one sleep. That's true. They kind of just go underground. They don't really sleep. Hmm. Yeah. Mm. Yeah. Or, they, or they catch on fire. <laughs> <laughs> or they catch on fire, yeah. That too. Yeah. Rough life. Yeah. <laughs> okay, next question. Will you ever add more types of weather to the game? Corey, you want to answer that one? Uh, I think more types of weather would be really cool. There's, I mean, there's so many different things you can do with that because you know, we, have, we have rain and snow and thunderstorms right now. But there's a lot of other kinds of uh, passive weather sort of that you can think of because earlier I mentioned we don't really want to add calamities that aren't player caused because that would break the rules of the game and destroy everything. You don't want that. Um, but sort of things like uh, we're talking about rainbows or you know, other yeah. ambient sort of idea things. And I think those would be pretty cool to add, actually. Yeah, I think there's a lot of room for, for weather effects that aren't disasters. I think whenever anyone asks, like, could we have more weather effects? And, and everyone just immediately jumps to tornadoes. Yeah. Um, th there's definitely, like, you could have maybe hail, and it just kind of hurts you, and that's it. Or, or maybe, maybe you could even just have, like, kind of heavy rain that just has, like, better particles on the floor. Or just light rain that doesn't really affect you at all. Um, I think especially with the more biomes we add, the, the more cool variations of different rain we, or weather, sorry, we could add. Yeah, and I'd also really like to see like auroras in the sky. Yeah. That'd be super cool. I, th I think things like those. <laughs> <laughs> oh, okay. 
I think things like those, um, just kind of like ambient effects is also a big part of it. Like you said, like auroras. Um, I know after seeing the video, a lot of people keep asking for shooting stars mm. in, in the, the biomes. Uh, just these kind of things. I think they could be very tied to weather effects and they're just like a nice thing that happens or sometimes a bad thing that happens, but isn't really... Like disasters. doesn't really, yeah, it, it isn't a disaster. It's a, it's a nuisance. Yes. Kind of like when it rains now and you go out and you're like, ah, I wanted to go farming today, but not all the zombies and skeletons are around. And you find a way to deal with it, but it's only short term. Mm. Yeah. Are and there uh, any... there's also like thunderstorms that kind of happen right yeah. now, but people forget that they happen. I think like we could expand more on those kind of things. Just like a, a kind of more intense and sometimes less intense version of the existing weather effects. Yeah, and I think it's really nice when you, let's say you built a house in the mountains in the snow biome and you're kind of just going about your business and then you look out the window and it's just snow all around you. I think that's really cool and we want to enhance that sort of feeling of I'm in the game right now. This is, yeah. this is what I am feeling right now because yeah. even I'm, I'm playing it seven years later and it starts snowing, I'm like, oh, that's really nice. Mm -hmm. See, that's why you should hook up a fan next to your desk that just blows whenever it's cold <laughs> in the game. <laughs> if you want to be immersed, just go the whole way. You may just uh, get a bucket of ice and dump it on me when it starts uh, healing. Yes. I mean, Gotta go speaking. full immersive. <laughs> so it's, it sounds like you're really into this, implementing new types of weather, but are there any like hurdles we need to come across before we can start implementing new types of weather? I think performance is going to be a big one. Anything that has particles is just yeah. going to... Yeah, we've, we've actually have, that's one of the things that we do to the performance stuff. We actually built a completely different weather system in the Bedrock version and the way Java did it. So we have a little more flexibility in the type of stuff we can do, but it's, you definitely have to be really careful about how much weather you put for performance reasons. We also currently have the problem, I don't know if it's a problem, maybe it's a, maybe it's a decision, that uh, weather is global. So you could be 10,000 miles away from, from your friend who's playing at the same time, and when it starts raining, it rains everywhere. And when it starts snowing, you know, it snows everywhere. There's no, like, kind of boundaries. It doesn't kind of work the same way in real life. So those kind of things, like the more biome-specific weathers or the, the more interesting weathers, do you really want like an aurora everywhere on the world or do you want it kind of like in a nice, interesting place to happen? Mm. Uh, we have no like precedent for something that's just kind of like region-specific Localized right weather. Now. Yeah. Closest we have is like, it doesn't actually rain in deserts. But it's yeah. kind of funny because you're walking along and it's pouring on you and you just, you're like, oops, hey, no weather. <laughs> yeah. <Sorry. laughs> right now we just have rain, but if you're in the desert, it doesn't show up. And then if you're in like a cold biome, and then it turns into snow. But it's still secretly raining behind the scenes. Yeah, we, we do a little bit of a transition in bedrock, but okay. it's still pretty abrupt. Yeah. Okay. New weather sounds cool in any way. So uh, we have time for one more question before we end this. Uh, next one, we ended on a fun note. <laughs> do Endermen rage because they are bad at steering contests? What do you think, Corey? I think that's pretty obvious. <laughs> I, I, would, I can't imagine any other reason why they would be so upset that you looked at them. I mean, <laughs> yeah, you just stare at them and they just keep staring back. I think it's... Oh no, he's done it again. <laughs> <laughs> and then they quit, oh, and then no. they come attack you and then you die. Yep. Yeah. <laughs> okay, and with that we're ending this panel. Uh, thanks everyone for tuning in. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. <laughs>